Hey, welcome. Uh, welcome again to the Elm City Vineyard. Uh, as Patrick said, my name's Matt. I'm glad to be here. Um, fair warning, um, I, am, I am like, I am at like peak medication right now, <clears throat> which is why I'm upright and speaking to you. But I'm feeling a little under the weather, so um, if there are sniffles here and there, or really anything that um, you find objectionable in today's talk, um, I, I, I recommend you take it up with um, my illness and just chalk it up to that. That would be great. Um, but, uh, you know, today uh, we're continuing our, our series um, on uh, the greatest commandment, uh, thinking about what it means to love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength, with all of our mind. And today we're talking about mind, human mind in particular, the ones I suppose that you and I have and that I and you suppose each other has. And we can't really know, but we, we assume. Um, no, I mean, that's like a thing. <laughs> Philosophers worry about that. But I, I, I take it there are, are two sort of big approaches to the mind that are prominent these days, um, two approaches that divide um, our nation, our city, um, sometimes our city sometimes gets divided along town and gown lines between folks affiliated with the university and not. That's not the only way that this works. And I suppose in certain ways this divide also runs within those communities as much as it runs between them as well. But these two different approaches, I don't know, we could think about one of them as uh, this, like what we call the intellectualist approach. For this approach, sort of thinking about the mind, it's funny, we're, talking, we're going to talk a lot about, about thinking about thinking today. Oh, well. Um, but for the intellect, it lets you know in which camp I fall. Um, uh, but uh, for the intellectualist approach, the mind is the central feature of what it is to be a human being. And the most important thing in life is cultivating our mental capacities, which are demonstrated largely through expertise. In this world, even if what we're after is mental capacity, we're after like aptitude or something like that is what we care about, what we can celebrate, what we can measure are our achievements and degrees. This would be the sort of thinking behind, um, I assume this sort of thinking is being ironized for sure, but this would be the sort of thinking behind the idea that the scarecrow didn't need a brain, he just needed a diploma of thinkology, if you remember how this goes at the end of Wizard of Oz. Um, you thought you needed a brain, you don't need a brain, you just need a degree. Um, no one's uh, any smarter than anybody else. Um, what they have, what these brilliant folks have is they have degrees, now you have one. On this approach, the mind is like a muscle, the body's most important muscle. And the more you exercise it, the stronger it gets. But as with all muscles, well, this way of thinking goes, as with all muscles, certain people might just like, have like, better raw material that they're working with. Um, they just might be stronger than others simply better at what makes us human. And that quickly gets uncomfortable, sort of like how I'm feeling about the ring on this microphone. So I'm going to switch to this. Does that work? I'll switch over. Um, that gets awkward really quickly. And sort of thought that, like, oof, maybe some people are just sort of have, like, more and are different or higher performing sort of equipment when it comes to, like, the thing that sort of most makes us people. That gets awkward, to say the least, but for whatever reason, culturally, this contradiction is rarely experienced by those who endorse it. Somehow, our great liberal institutions of education are at once the greatest, great proponents of egalitarianism in all sorts of ways, and also the chief gatekeepers of the meritocracies. And somehow, this never dawns on anyone um, that the intellectualist meritocracy is fundamentally anti-egalitarian. But in any case, in this approach, clear thinking is crucially important and extremely rare, and so to be prized. It's more likely to be found at places like Yale, one supposes in this world, in, in this worldview. Um, it would be more likely to be found at a place like Yale than other places, though, um, again, there's a sort of, uh, a sort of imagined, at least egalitarian sort of meritocracy meritocracy to this in this sort of way of thinking. Um, one loves to be surprised at all the, way, all the places where genius might pop up. 
That's one sort of way of thinking about the mind. Then there's the anti-intellectual backlash. And this approach says there's much more to being human than having a mind. And when it comes to the mind, this approach, this is the approach that insists all I ever needed to know I learned in kindergarten. To this approach, intellectualism is arrogance, plain and simple. Clear thinking in this approach is actually not all that rare. Though if there's anywhere that clear thinking might be in short supply, that place might be a place like, I don't know, Yale. As my wife often observes, right, like high intelligence often correlates with low common sense. And on this sort of view, right, this sort of thought of what really ma matters when it comes to the mind might actually be in short supply precisely in those places where the intellectualists think it's most found. And if what you want to celebrate when it comes to the human mind is common sense, then these sorts of places might be the last places to go looking. Now, of course, there are religious versions of these two schools. The first supposes that God, being the greatest object of study there might ever be, that object would be most worthy of our attention, and our study surely will be all the better, the smarter, the cleverer we are. And if we're new to religious community, this approach can be profoundly like, disqualifying. On this account, knowing God is like the hardest school subject there ever was, and one that we've maybe never taken a course in. And if you're still trying to figure out whether this God thing is for you, and you're here this afternoon, let me just put you at ease. I don't, I don't take it that you're like, behind on your prerequisites or something like that. Of course, it's quite possible to feel just as excluded and looked down upon by religious intellectualism, even if you've hung around religious communities for a good long while, which is probably part of the reason why religious communities, too, have their own anti-intellectual backlashes. In this case, the thought is that all I really need to know, I learned in Sunday school. Though the religious version of that slogan is, the particularly Christian version of that slogan is, the gospel was understood and preached by uneducated fishermen. If the gospel you preach couldn't be understood by Galilean fishermen, then you've missed the mark. It's not quite as pithy. There are more pithy versions of that slogan. <laughs> but, all right. We could just call it like the Galilean fisherman test. And that becomes a litmus test for sniffing out religious intellectualism and piously telling the eggheads to shut up. And if the first approach can leave newcomers feeling disqualified, this second approach can be terrifying because it can seem to suggest that to join a religious community, you need to check your brain at the door. And to be honest, many a church, I think, has, val has validated precisely that fear. And if that's a fear that you have brought with you today, let me say, I have found ECV to be a community where my most careful thinking and my most skeptical questions have been welcomed, and I hope that you will find the same. Now, each of these approaches gets something important right. Knowing God, I believe, is the activity for which the human being was created mind, body, soul, and strength. So some care and some rigor and some attention invested in knowing God with our minds will yield dividends. That's true. But the slogan about the fishermen and the gospel is also like unassailably true. The good news of God's work in the world doesn't require and isn't enriched by our cleverness. But each of these two also gets something profoundly wrong. And, and, and ironically, I think each actually gets the same thing profoundly wrong. That is in their extreme forms, and you've gotten the sense, I'm, I'm putting straw men up here. But in their extreme forms, each of these camps assumes that it has God figured out. The intellectualist thinks they have God figured out because they're so flippin' smart. And the anti-intellectualist think that they understand God because the gospel is so simple. As a result, both draw us away from mystery. And that, I take it, 
is a disaster. Because to relate to God with our minds is to relate to a mystery. And I don't mean like a mystery like you find in a book or watch in a movie, something where you, you get it figured out by the end of 60 minutes. I mean like a real a genuine mystery, something that's un, that you're, you're just never going to puzzle out. To relate to God with our minds is to relate to a mystery and nevertheless to do so while deeply engaging our minds. And that's what I want to talk about this afternoon. Relating to a God who is mysterious, who's beyond our comprehension, who routinely frustrates our very cleverest thinking, a God who nevertheless invites us to worship God with all our mind. A God who is not afraid of our questions, a God who isn't hoping that we will be clever enough to figure God out, a God who never asks us to check our brain at the door, but offers instead a renewal of our minds. And I believe that very God is present here in this place, present to our bodies, present to our souls, present should we be attentive to our minds. So as we prepare, let's, let's just take a moment to be attentive. Let's pray. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us in this place. Open our minds to encounter you and to become like you. Have your way. Amen. So the way I want to tackle um, this question this afternoon about how to relate to our minds as we relate to God is by looking at the writer, writings of, uh, of Paul, the ancient church planter. And the question of how to relate to the mind was actually pivotal for Paul personally, and in just as much, I take it, pivotal for many of the churches that he led as well. In particular, in the church in, uh, to which Paul wrote the most letters— um, that is the, the church in Corinth, um, this question of how to relate to the mind was a particularly hot topic. In many ways, we can see the same two camps that we see in our own culture in the church in Corinth. The folks who like to call themselves the strong were much like our intellectualists. The other camp, the folks whom the so-called strong called the weak, I'm sure they really appreciated that. Um, that group, understandably, then had tendencies in the sort of anti-intellectualist or anti-strong <laughs> direction. Paul begins his first letter to the Corinthian church by putting his finger on precisely this dynamic. He's been told about what's going on, and he names it right from jump. There is strife within the community, and it has to do with different postures toward wisdom. Some are looking for wisdom, others are looking for signs or for strength. Everyone is mystified by the gospel of a crucified Messiah. And the limitation of human wisdom is obvious enough. He says, where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom didn't know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached, the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. There's this sort of upside-down way that God's relating to the wisdom of the world and this other sort, this other sort of, 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 of what looks like foolishness in the world that God is, 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 through which God is speaking to the community, speaking to the world. And Paul says this shouldn't be a surprise. After all, 
After all, he says, we are mysteries to one another. How could we hope to know God? He puts it this way. He says, for who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. And so he says, if we're thinking about our minds as a means of mastery, if we're thinking about our minds as means of mastery, able to master the world either because we're so smart or because the world is, at the end of the day, more or less straightforward, then we are entirely on the wrong track. And you don't even have to get on, on you don't even have to get to God talk for mystery to come into the picture. According to Paul, you could just consider the person next to you, or maybe better, consider the person it is who you know best in the world, and then consider how far you still are from truly knowing what it is to be them, to see what they see, to wake up as them, to think what and how they think. Then consider that there are 7.6 billion such bottomless mysteries upon this earth. If you're invested in mind as means of mastery, whether as intellectualists or or anti-intellectualists, then you have lost before you've begun. And now we will get to the God talk because still holding those 7.6 billion bottomless mysteries in your mind, now consider the possibility of a being from whom, in whom, and through whom they and the plants and the animals and a hundred million stars in each of more than two trillion galaxies, consider this being from whom, in whom, and through whom this whole cosmos has its being. If we are bottomless mysteries, then God is the bottomlessly mysterious source of uncountable bottomless mysteries. Paul quotes the Hebrew prophet Isaiah, who has known, who has known the mind of the Lord such as to instruct him. God is mysterious beyond all knowing. It's a rhetorical question. The implied answer is no one. But Paul answers this rhetorical question and gives an answer Isaiah could not have seen coming. Who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. The only mind who can know God is God's mind. So, in theory, we are out of luck. But the indwelling of Christ changes this. Christ, being God, but also human, makes it possible for the human to know God. And what's more, because, as Paul repeatedly insists, Christ lives within us and we live in Christ, Christ, then then, then Christ's mind actually dwells within, I think better to say, among us. And so, at the end of the day, Despite everything we said about the bottom, the source of bottomless mysteries, the mysterious source of bottomless mysteries, who is God. In principle, we can know God better than we can know one another. Not because we've figured God out, but because God is so insistent in revealing God to us. So insistent, in fact, that God has given the mind of Christ to us. So how should we imagine this mind of Christ? What does Paul mean? Is this like an alien body-snatching sort of replacement of my mind with Christ's mind? I don't think that's how it works. Even having described the pivotal role that the mind of Christ plays in the life of the Christian and of Christian community, uh, Paul continues to talk about what we might call people's sort of natural individual minds. Is the mind of Christ sort of a 
a supernatural supplement to my mind such that I'm miraculously able to know and understand things that I couldn't previously. That's probably not entirely wrong. Paul seems to say something like this at the beginning of 1 Corinthians. The things that Paul preaches are spiritually discerned, he says, and can only be understood by spiritual people. But again, it's not like our own natural minds are superseded or sort of out of the picture. And it's not as if it happens by magic, as it were. There's a, there's a definite cooperation between our minds and the mind of Christ, as we'll see. Or maybe the mind of Christ is, this would be another species of the supernatural supplement theory. Maybe the mind of Christ is a supernatural supplement to my mind that allows me to exercise spiritual gifts of knowledge things like prophecy or words, those sorts of things that supplement my natural ability to know. I think here we're, we're, we're getting closer yet. Paul talks about a number of so-called gifts that come from the Holy Spirit that seem to have to do with the mind, gifts of prophecy, gifts of words of knowledge. And we experience this regularly here at ECV as we encounter God's Spirit together. We find that we are able, um, fallibly but assuredly, we're able to hear from God. Some people see pictures in their minds as they pray, that, pictures that seem to come from somewhere other than their own mind. Others, others get mental impressions of other sorts, impressions of words or of ideas, or sometimes like emotional content without too much additional context. Over time, we learn to distinguish these impressions from other sorts of impressions, what the Bible calls learning to recognize the voice of the shepherd. And this sort of input from God has become a staple of our communal life together. Um, and I know that can sound crazy if you're encountering it for the first time, but this has been our experience, that God is speaking, and actually we can learn to hear God's voice. But consider what I just said. As we listen, our experience is that we get mental impressions of various sorts. God doesn't bypass the mind, but in fact, our minds become a place of encounter with God. Our minds are, among other places, places where God shows up and we have a chance to interact with God. Paul describes this relationship between spiritual gifts and the mind in detail in his first letter to the church at Corinth. Much later here, we're in chapter 14 now. He says, Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray for the power to interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unproductive. What should I do then? I will pray with the spirit, but I will pray with the mind also. I will sing praise with the spirit, but I will sing praise with the mind also. One might think, as apparently some in Corinth thought, that the things of the Spirit, especially something as sort of out there as praying in a tongue, um, that, as far as we can tell, is something like a language that you don't know, but a language uh, that God knows, a language maybe even known only to God. Um, if that's your first time hearing about that, I don't know what to tell you, <laughs> other than say, like, Paul thought it was real, um, and um, maybe this will break a little bit of trust if, of you in me, but um, I've experienced this, um, and others around here have as well. Um, so if that weirds you out, like, come talk to me. Um, I'm happy, happy to talk to you about it sometime, um, maybe, like, <clears throat> after the cold meds are done. You would trust me more in that state as well. <laughs> But one might think that such things, especially that sort of thing, right, something like that, like speaking in a language you don't even understand, something like that, that bypasses and therefore must bypass and therefore displace my mind, right? And, and if I've got direct access to God, wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be better? I mean, just let my mind get out of the way. But Paul says it's not an either or. It's actually a both and. We pray with the spirit, but we also pray with the mind. We sing with the spirit. We sing also with the mind. So this serious engagement with these sort of transrational spiritual gifts of prophecy, of tongues, and yet, Paul says, we ought to do so with our minds fully engaged. Engaged. 
This is what it looks like to love God with our minds, according to Paul, the sort of dynamic relationship of our minds and the mind of Christ and the presence of the Spirit. And it's all sort of worked together. And if you're trying to find the boundaries, you're not going to find them. Um, but you're just doing your best to like learn to hear the voice. And yet you're still leaving aside the most, one of the most important things the important role played by the community. The best way to think about it, I, I take it, is that the mind of Christ, the mind of Christ isn't a supernatural supplement like for me and for you. I think the mind of Christ is a, like a collective capacity of the Christian community. It's like something that we do together as the body of Christ. The mind of Christ is something we have, to whatever extent we have it at all, it's something we have together. Maybe better, it's something we function as together, which surely does impact individual minds. Our individual minds need transformation in order to participate collectively in the mind of Christ. But, but there's something fundamentally communal about the way that the mind of Christ operates in the world, which is why when Paul later describes spiritual renewal of the mind in his letter to the church in Rome, he describes the renewal of a collective mind. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is, per what is good and acceptable and perfect. And a word to the wise here, if you're following along in your own Bible, your translation may, may well get that wrong and have minds, where the Greek clearly says mind. Here, as in so many other places, um, though Paul is talking to a group of people, he refers simply to a single collective mind. Again, I, I, I take it there's also a renewal of individuals, and we see evidence of that in Paul's letters as well. But the pivotal transformation, the most important thing that Paul's always going on about, is this transformation that happens within and among a community. It's about how we discern the will of God together, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And you don't even have to be bought into religious thinking in order to see what Paul's getting at here. I mean, we, we see this basic dynamic in the world all the time. Our, our moral reasoning is profoundly shaped by the moral reasoning of those around us. In fact, almost all of our language, all of our moral language, morals, ethics, norms, all of these words at their root, each one of these words is about what is acceptable within a certain group. The word morals, right, is, comes from the same root as the like, cultural mores, right? This, just whatever's customary. Ethics comes from a Greek word that means basically the same thing, just um, F-A-K, uh, custom. Norms, well, we, we know that, what that one is, right? It's about like, what's no, what counts as normal in a group. The mind of Christ is in part about a continual spiritual renewal of our norms, our sense of what is good and pleasing and perfect, our ideals. And Paul describes in chapter 14 back in 1 Corinthians about how the mind of Christ works in practice and in community. What then shall we say, brothers and sisters, when you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. This is a picture of the communal process of participating in the mind of Christ, of discerning the will of God, the, the, the norms that should direct our lives. And I take it this is what we are doing this afternoon, right? Like, like Ruth brought some hymns, some songs. Um, I've been sharing, I, I don't know, I guess this would be the, the word of instruction. Let's just be glad that we don't call it that. Um, but like later we'll have a time for prayer in which we'll share words and, and that, words that we hear, revelations of various sorts, maybe even a tongue and an interpretation. The goal is that we build one another up that we exercise Christ's care for Christ's own body. From before there was an ECV, this was a core part of my experience of what it was to be ECV. And when I, when I um, first showed up at, uh, at a home group that would eventually, it was like a home group 
that would become the home group, that would become the Elm City Vineyard Church. Um, it, was, uh, it was my first time encountering a group of people who took so seriously these spiritual practices, I, that we would listen for the, for the voice of God, that we would, um, we, we, would, uh, we, would, we would pray for one another and expect that God would show up as we did. And we were going to be totally honest the whole way through that we're like still just like, you know, human beings with, with like brains and bodies and like are going to get some things wrong and are, but are chasing after Jesus together. It's one of the things I, 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 I think it's, it's, just who, it's just who we are. I think, it's who the, I think it's who the church is. I think it's that, this, this picture that Paul, is, that Paul is giving us. We don't have to choose between intellectualism or anti-intellectualism. We get neither of those in their extremes. But neither do we have to choose between the mind and the spirit. There's this, both are part of who we are and part of what God's doing in the world. And so in the end, rather than pick a side between the so-called weak and strong in Corinth, Paul instead describes and champions a third group. A group he calls the mature the mature, the adults. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, stop thinking like children. That's in the Bible. It's in there. In regard to evil, be infants. But in your thinking, be adults. He's saying, fine, both of y'all, strong and weak intellectuals, anti-intellectuals, you go stand over there. That's the children's table. I'll be over here with the grown-ups. Stop thinking like children. He's not pun pulling punches. There's more than a bit of edge there in the rhetoric. But I think Paul's right to look at our spats inside and outside the church along these lines and name the whole thing is more than a bit childish. The goal isn't to be more or less intellectual. Neither a victory of the mind over the spirit nor of the spirit over the mind. The goal, Paul says, is maturity. And maturity with respect to the mind, is something Paul has already defined in, his, in, in this same letter back in chapter 13, right before all of this. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully even as I am fully known. That word that's translated completeness up there a little bit, when completeness comes, that word that's translated completeness, it's the same word translated elsewhere as mature or adult. And believe it or not, it's also the same word translated back in that passage we were reading in Romans as perfect more on that in a second. The complete, the mature, the whole, the perfect. So what does it mean to think like a grown-up? Well, I, th I think according to this passage, it means letting love be the standard. Let love be the standard for the maturity of our thinking. Whenever in the intellectualist mode we look down on others for not knowing what we know, it's a failure of love. When we make moral judgments based on intellectual criteria, that's a failure of love. For example, when we confuse doing justice with using the sort of woke lingo that one picks up in elite academic environments, that is a failure of love. <laughs> 
I'm not saying language doesn't matter, but if the only people who count as good people for us are people who have learned to talk about race and gender and sexuality and politics the ways that we do at Yale, then we're talking about a failure of love. Whenever in an anti-intellectualist mode we prejudge someone because they do use that sort of lingo, or we're unable to receive wisdom from someone because we think our spiritual gifts have landed us beyond the need of wisdom, that too is a failure of love. It's the rule of love that means, which, which tells Paul that both the, the mind and the spirit are for building up. I take it the rule of, of whatever builds up it would be uh, Paul's own gloss for what it means to use the standard of love. Second, I take it thinking like a grown-up also means recognizing our fallibility. And a bunch of lines that speak to this in that passage that we just read. We know in part and we prophesy in part. We see only a reflection as in a mirror. Paul's talking in that chapter about the capital E end of all things and the transition that will happen. In the end, he says, we'll know in full. But in the meantime, which is to say, in every moment that you and I have yet experienced, we need to know that our knowledge is limited. And thinking like a grown-up means acknowledging the fragility and incompleteness of our knowledge. And Paul started there in chapters 1 and 2, from which we read at the beginning. He returns again here to the same idea. And in case, so in case you thought that the, but we have the mind of Christ answer meant that we could leave all that intellectual humility behind, think again. Any mature Christian life, this side of kingdom come, has to be marked by intellectual humility. Part of maturity, part of completion, part of perfection. Remember, those are all the same word. So part of perfection, this side of perfection, is recognizing that perfection really isn't on the menu. Part of maturity is knowing the boundaries of what is and isn't possible for you. And having humility about it. A ready willingness to say what you don't know. To lean into wonder. Which means, in the final accounting... The thinking like a grown-up means coming to know ourselves as mastered by mystery. For now I know in part, but even now, I take it, already I am fully known. There's a limit to how much we can know, but there is no limit to how much we are already known and loved by God. Which means that thinking like an adult means a serious shift in how we think about our minds, especially for those of us like me who like the feeling that we get when we master something intellectually. Because thinking like an adult, loving God with our whole mind, means no longer seeing our mind as a means of mastery, but rather as a site of being mastered by mystery. Loving God with our whole mind means giving up on trying to master God or even mastering the genuine mysteries of God's creation and instead allowing our minds and our thoughts themselves to become places where we are mastered by these very mysteries and by the one who is the source of all of them, by God. Thinking like adults means giving up on apprehension and allowing ourselves to be apprehended by a God who is pursuing us in love. Pastor Bill was uh, a couple Sundays ago running a, a, a ran a session. There were a lot of people in that room. It could have been half of this room. I don't know <laughs> on um, on setting a rule of life. And we were sort of thinking about, he invited us to think about times when we had really connected with God, what sorts of um, practices we might want to pick up where, where we might um, regularly connect with God. And I was drawn in that moment back to the, 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 the number of times that I have had profound encounters with God um, that are, well, they have a feature to them as it turns out. They're at night and by the water. <laughs> 
It occurred to me for the purposes of my rule of life that I live near a pond <laughs> and could take walks there on a regular basis. But in those moments, in those moments, in, the, in that stillness, in sitting in that place in the not quite darkness, because there's always the moon and the stars and sadly too many city lights, there's something about the presence of God that's both beyond but yet really present to my own experience of life, right? My own mind. And there's been something really, really grounding for me as someone who thinks a lot, <laughs> like thinks professionally. <laughs> something really important about having those moments where I do something else. It's, but the thing is to realize that it's not that it's not with my mind, right? There's, 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 there's an engagement of my mind in those moments that isn't about trying to figure something out, but instead an experience, like I said, not about trying to apprehend anything, but an experience of being apprehended by one who is beyond anything I could measure. I think worship for me, musical worship in particular, does something similar. I think we need these sorts of practices. I've I just recently strapped this thing to my, to my wrist and it, you know, it, it, it starts telling you to breathe every once in a while. It's like really micromanaging your life at that point. Um, but um, it's, I, I think it's, well, anyway, I, I won't, don't get me into like mindfulness incorporated and um, the way that this is an embodiment of that. But anyway, um, what, what, I've, what I have taken it to be is, 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 a, is an invitation to, to pray breath prayers, right, in those moments. Is it, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Six times in a row, facilitated by Apple Computer. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a moment, right, to say, uh, here I am. Usually, I've been working, so I'm engaged with my mind. I'm not going to disengage my mind. I'm going to engage my mind in a different sort of way that's not aimed at trying to master something, but at recognizing the ways in which I am always already mastered by your and my Heavenly Father. All right. A few thoughts and some next steps that you might take. First, um, right on this point, I encourage you to ask God to show you just how much you are known and loved by God. Especially if you're one of, one of you know, one of us like figure outerers, right? Um, someone who's always trying to f f figure things out. Press pause on that. And maybe you have really important questions about God, and I'm not. I'm going to be the last person to tell you to just, like, drop those. But as you hold those, um, as you're trying to figure out what you might be able to know about God, what you need to know about God, ask what God might already know about you. And what does it mean that you are, at least as Paul claims, you are fully known and fully loved? Second, and this might be less enjoyable, encourage us to measure our habits of thinking against the rule of love. I worked through one really small example, but it's, this is something that I know I need to spend some time on uh, this week. Think about the ways that you use your mind and the ways that you um, sort of deploy your, your thoughts or the ways that you think about other people's thoughts or whatnot. Um, and, and let's, let's I, think we, I think it would help, be helpful to sort of really ask the question, like, does this, does this pass the rule of love? Does it meet that affirmation that Paul gives that love never fails? And then finally, I would encourage you to lean in one way or another into mystery. <laughs> 
you might do that even now in worship and in prayer. Lean into mystery, not as a way of disengaging your mind, but as a way of engaging your mind differently, otherwise. So I'm gonna invite the worship team to come up and, and Patrick's gonna facilitate communion, but I just wanna pray for us before, before that happens. Um, You can remain seated, but if you'd like to, I'd encourage you to just, like, just open your hands. Our bodies often help our whole selves sort of get into different sorts of postures. I'm just going to pray for the Holy Spirit to come and be with us. Spirit is, is here and has been present with us already, but Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us in this place. Where we are striving to apprehend, would you help us instead come to know ourselves as ones that are apprehended by you? Where we're grasping for knowledge, would you show us how we are held already in your hands, in your grasp? Renew our minds, and even more so, renew our mind together that we could discern your will, what is good and pleasing and perfect and complete and mature. Cultivate that maturity of thought and of mind, especially today. In us, we pray. Mm -hmm.